Hey, good evening. It's a great joy to be with you today, and I'm very honored uh, to be here, both by Pastor Joel and uh, Pastor Sam Kyung as well, who uh, extended me this invitation. I'd like to begin by, uh, before even addressing the topic, to look to passage in scripture. The topic that has been given to me is, where is God uh, in war and COVID losses? I'd like to begin by looking to the text of scripture, Genesis chapter 15, sorry, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 uh, to 20. And I was told that after this talk, we'll, I'll, I'll have an exam uh, in the form of a Q&A session, uh, and that's good. Uh, so I look forward to that. Please turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, and I'll read from verse 15. And after I'm done reading Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 to 20, I will end by saying, this is the word of the Lord. And I hope that you could reply. You have a standard reply to that. Thanks be to God. Uh, Marcus is an Anglican. He, knows, he, he will know how to do that. So uh, let's read Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 to 20. I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground before you. Because it's the ground because of you, in pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's look to God and pray. God, we are thankful to you for your word. We're thankful that you have given us your word. You have not left yourself without wisdom. Even as we explore the topic of pain and suffering, we pray that you will help answer that question yourself from your word. Give us your perspective on the problem. Despite the fact, God, we know there are many perspectives, only yours matter. Help us see suffering and evil from your lens and point us to the ultimate solution that is found in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. The question of where is God in COVID and losses and, and COVID and war is a question that, I mean, is asked in many different uh, ways. I mean, if uh, you go to give an apologetic talk, this is one of the main questions that come up, especially when dealing with secular people, people who refuse to believe that there is a God. When you speak to atheists, and about three weeks ago, I was, we were in Penang, Marcus and myself, uh, we were in Penang with our team in Explain, and I had the opportunity to debate with an atheist. Uh, this atheist, uh, sadly, was a former pastor. He had been a pastor for uh, uh, been, been, been a minister in church full time and eventually lost his faith and now he actually leads a group of atheists uh, and it was very interesting uh, engaging uh, a former pastor and this is on YouTube for those of you who want to watch this you can uh, engaging a pastor is very interesting because he seems to know all the Bible verses and in the process of that dialogue one of the things that came up is that the reason he lost his faith is because of a loss, pain and suffering. It was a loss of uh, a loved one, uh, or rather a, a, a loved one of his friend. And when he saw that this person was not healed, he concluded that where is God in all of this? And that was the, his basis for losing his faith. So the question is a meaningful one and it's asked in all sorts of ways. But the one thing we need to realize is that this, unlike most questions that we face in apologetics, the defense of the Christian faith is an emotional one. There are logical questions that we can ask. Questions like, where, I mean, what was God doing before he created the world? That's a logical question. Questions like, can you give evidences for the existence of God? 
questions like, does evolution disprove the creation account in Genesis chapter one to three, uh, Genesis one and two? These are logical questions. But the question of pain and suffering is not merely a logical one, even though sometimes it's phrased as such, it's an emotional one. Sometimes behind that question is a person that's grieved by a loss that they've had. And so the question in a nutshell makes an assumption. The assumption behind the question, where is God in war and COVID losses is that God is only there when things are good. In church, when you have an opportunity to give testimonies, you would realize that people will usually start their testimonies by saying that God has been good to me. How? And he's been good by giving us A, B, C, D. And you can go down the list. God has been gracious to me. He's given me this. He's blessed me this. Just speaking to Pastor Joel, I was telling him that God's been good. But what happens when things don't go well? Does that mean God's been bad? More importantly and more pertinent to our topic, has God gone missing when things don't work out? And that's a question we need to ask. And the tendency for most Christian apologists, those who try to defend the Christian faith, is to make up excuses for God. I was in Atlanta uh, last year. I remember being invited there by a group of atheists in the US. And the reason they invited me there is they wanted to do a debate. They, was they were having an atheist conference uh, in Atlanta. It was a summit. They had a bunch of panel speakers. And at the end of the, the conference or the summit, they wanted to do a debate with a Christian, and I was the guy they uh, invited. I'll get more to the story in the end, but the topic of the debate was, is the Christian God evil? That's the question that seems to come up more and more. And one, one of the things that I did, which I found tended to work quite well, was to begin my talk by saying, in this talk, I will not be making excuses for God. And the reason I say that is because far too often, Christian apologetics has focused on giving excuses for God. And we do that either by downplaying the intensity of the suffering, or by trying to say that maybe God had good reasons for doing this. Now, those, I mean, that very well is true that God has good reasons, but we've got to deal with the problem in directly. And so I want to get to, here are some things to analyze it, if you're putting it up. The next slide, please. We exist in, in the far right, at least for my side, uh, well, for your side, far left. So the existence of evil and suffering is there. Like we, we, we agree there's such a thing as evil and suffering exists. The atheist agrees for the most part, uh, and most people would agree, evil and suffering do exist. And then you have to ask, once we establish that evil and suffering do exist, there are two questions that need to be asked. Number one, who is responsible for the evil and the suffering in the world? Number two, who is culpable? In other words, who is to be blamed for the evil and suffering? Now, I think one of the problems is that for the most part, we don't distinguish these two questions. We lump them as one. The one who is responsible is also the one who is to be blamed. And I think that that's not true. You can demonstrate that in every legal system. Go to, uh, you know, I was looking through a documentary about uh, capital punishment in Europe. Um, and if you look through the, the horrors of capital punishment, there is suffering, there is pain. Who is responsible for the suffering? The government is. The government is, is bestowing, if you like, for lack of a better word, the suffering upon the convict. But who is to be blamed? It's a, a, a convict that is blamed. The person who is assuming, of course, that that person did commit the crime. The person who committed the crime is ultimately culpable, even though the person is not responsible for the suffering that he or she faces. So I think in this world, we've got to realize that we must distinguish these two questions. Who is responsible for the suffering in the world? And who is to be blamed? Who is culpable? And to this, I think there's very little dispute that ultimately when we look at the passage we just read, Genesis chapter 3, we see that humanity is 
culpable. Humanity is to be blamed. We are the ones that inflict the sufferings upon ourselves. Look about wars. Who, who is behind all these wars? People. If you look at the horrors and the atrocities of the Second World War, uh, I mean, that's just happened about a, some uh, less than 100 years ago. You look at the horrors that's happening in wars in different parts of the world, the Middle East, in Russia, Ukraine. You can jump on which side you want to of that conflict. But one thing we cannot deny is that humanity is ultimately culpable. But the question of who is responsible is not that straightforward. Who is responsible for the evil and the suffering in the world? And to this, there are two responses offered. The first response is what may come across as an outrageous response. God is responsible. And those who claim that say that, well, God is responsible because God has a greater good behind all of this. And then there's a second camp that says blasphemy. How dare you say that God would be do such a thing? Humanity is both responsible and culpable. And what they would say is humans have abused free will. God has endowed people with free will, they claim. And humanity has used it against God. And so humanity is ultimately responsible and culpable. Now, if it were only that simple, then one could easily excuse and say God is not to be blamed because ultimately humanity is both responsible and culpable. But when we look through the scriptures, that's where things get a little bit more complicated. Genesis chapter 315 again, please. The next one. Thanks. The scripture begins by saying, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. Now, this is God speaking. And God is saying this to Satan. Behind every wars, behind every conflict is enmity. And I'm going to throw the question to you this evening. Who is responsible for the enmity between Satan himself and the human race? Keeping in mind that ultimately Satan is the one behind most, if not all of human conflict. Who is responsible for that enmity? As much as I love to scream Satan is... The text of scripture says otherwise. I will put enmity. And so the scripture points to God as the one who is ultimately responsible for the greatest of enmity, which leads to all the conflicts that you see. And it goes on to say, verse 16. Now, I'll just stay with verse 15 first. You go to Genesis chapter, this is Genesis 3. You go to Genesis 4. You've got Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. You go on, you see Genesis 4, another murder, uh, murder is taking place. You go to Genesis and you see all sorts of violence taking place. But this is the starting point, the four words that we should never forget. I will put enmity. God is behind this evil and the suffering in the world. Now, you can say that may be true of conflict, enmity. But it doesn't just stop there. There is, you know, we, we distinguish when we talk about evil, there's a difference between um, moral evil, which is moral atrocities we do to one another. And there's a difference between natural evil, right? Natural disasters. My house was affected by the, the flood not too long ago. Uh, yesterday, I heard this place uh, was spared. So God is good, right? Um, yeah. If there was a church on the other side, God was not so good to them. Um, I'm kidding. Uh, but the point is that at the end of the day, you can say, well, moral evil, blame it on human beings. But what about natural evil? What about things like actual pain as a result in nature? God says, I will surely multiply your pain. So when we give a response as Christians to a world that is suffering in pain, bear in mind that in the very first three chapters of the Bible, God takes responsibility for suffering and pain. That's shocking. How do you account for that? And while the Christian apologist is tirelessly striving to say that, no, no, God is not as bad as you make him out to be, the text of scripture contradicts it. We've got to deal with that. Now, 
to when you when you look through the pain of childbearing this is something that just takes place in physical pain but if you look through all the matriarchs you look through sarah she can't give birth childbearing a problem rebecca can't give birth childbearing problem rachel three generations in a row childbearing has got problems why in genesis itself all these problems are there well, I'll get to that at the end of this discussion. But the point is, God takes responsibility. When you look at nature, God says, curse is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. The reason that I'm bringing up all this is to stress that God himself claims responsibility for both natural evil and moral evil in the world. That's not to say God is to be blamed. But it is a consequence, a judgment against human sin so is god going back to the analogy capital punishment lots of pain throwing people behind bars lots of suffering who is responsible to that for that the government is who is culpable the criminal is and likewise just like that criminal analogy you and i all humanity stand sinful behind in the face of a holy god we the question of where is God in evil and suffering assumes a world in which sin does not exist. But in this sinful world, the holy God himself is judge. The holy God himself is the one who is giving the punishment. And we stand guilty before this God. And it's this God that puts enmity. It's this God that multiplies pain. It's this God that puts all of this on us. And while we may be tempted to say, no, humanity is responsible if we go down that route, we end up in danger of doing one thing, focusing our attention on saving and transforming man. And that's something that you and I can never do. Some people thought that education was the answer to the problem. If only you educate people enough, you will help them not create more mess and that together we can create a utopia of educated people. But after World War I and World War II, we saw that that's not the case at all. I think it was G.K. Chesterton that said, you see a guy stealing metal on the side of the railroad, you think you give him education, he will stop stealing. After the education, he learns to steal the entire railroad itself. We have just empowered the problem. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And so we cannot look to humanity to resolve this problem, hoping that if all of us come to our senses, we will all make this place a utopia because ultimately it is a hard problem and only God can fix that problem. Let me close by looking to the life of Job. Job's life was marked by suffering. But the one thing that was very unique about Job is that you have an entire book of suffering. When you come to the story, the start of the story, Job chapter one, you find Satan coming before God, and all of us think that Satan is responsible for the problem. But a closer analysis of Job shows a completely different story. Because Satan comes before God, and God's first question to Satan is, where have you been? And Job, well, Satan answers the question. And what is God's next question? Have you considered my servant Job? Like you and I were Job. Like, thanks very much for that. You just put a target right on my back and Satan is going to try to, to hit. That's what God did. And Satan says, you know, have you not put a hedge around him? Have you? And he says to him, you let me strike him. And he will curse you. And God says, go. Who brought up Job? It was not Satan that brought up Job. It was God. Unless you and I want to make the claim that God was so naive, he had no clue what was coming next? You and I have got to acknowledge God was responsible. The whole book of Job from then on comes to the angry complaint of a man who says to his wife, shall we accept good from God and not evil? Job's understanding is both good and evil comes from the hands of God. Oh, some people may think that's outrageous. Only good come from the hand of God. Start with Genesis 3. Start with the fall. We realize, number one, we are sinful and evil, suffering, pain, whether it's COVID, whether it's wars, is a repercussion of human sinfulness. And when we move on and on, you see that come to, you come to the book of Job. Job holds God responsible for his pain and sufferings. 
His friends, not so much. His friends are like, you know, those guys singing, God is good all the time. Put the song off, you know. Uh, and that was, that was Job's friends. <laughs> those are good friends to have around when you're going through a personal tragedy in life. Right? Guys will come alongside you and say, no, it's all your fault, brother. Humanity is responsible. You are responsible. Don't blame God. But no, Job throughout all this blames God. Let me run through a few verses uh, here. Uh, next one, please. Job 27 verse 2, as God lives, says Job, who has taken away my right and the almighty who has made my soul bitter. Job holds God responsible. Next one, please. Job 34 verse 5, for Job has said, I am in the right and God has taken away my right. Job's accusing God. He accuses God of depriving him his human rights. Apparently human rights was a thing even in the Old Testament. It's not a modern thing. Job 19 was seven to nine. Although I cried out violence, I received no answer. I cried for help, but there was no justice. Now, who is Job accusing here? He's accusing God. He's saying, I cried out to God and there's no justice with God. If there was justice, I wouldn't be suffering, says Job. Job goes on to say, he blocked my path so I cannot pass. He's, and he turned out the lights on my pathways. He has stripped me of my honor. He has stolen the crown off my head. Job accused God of stealing his honor. That's pretty strong accusations. And Job's friends would have none of it. Job, it's all your fault. You are responsible for the tragedies that have come over your life. But it's very interesting how the book ends though. The book ends on a very different note. Can you go to the next slide, please? At the end of it all, this is God's verdict. God's response to Job's accusations. And God says, next one, please. Verse 7, after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Clearly, PR wasn't God's thing. Did you just say that the friends were wrong and Job was right? <laughs> he accused you of robbing his honor. He accused you of depriving him his human rights. He accused you of injustice. And God says, he's right. I did it. I was responsible. In fact, God doesn't say it once. He says it twice. Verse 8. Now, this is God going to the friends who defended him. God goes to the guys who say, no, no, God wouldn't do such a thing, Job. You are the one that is wrong. God goes to them and says, now, therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. God, you said that already. You, you did. But the point is, he repeats it twice. Job said what was right about me, you did not. Job accused you. That's what he did. We were defending you. And God says to the guys who defended him, you go to Job, the guy who was accusing me. You ask him to pray for you, to me, so that I don't deal with you according to your folly. The book doesn't end there, you know, four verses down, three verses down. Next one, please. The book concludes by saying to him, then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. All the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. But that tells us something. As we go back to Genesis 3.15 again. God is the one who is bringing evil. He does it for two reasons. Reason number one, he does it because we are guilty before him. The question, where is God when there's so much evil, only is true in a world where humanity is sinless. But in this sinful world, we deserve every bit of it. And it's only when we understand that we are fully deserving of the evil that we get that we cannot, and we cannot understand the goodness of God in the evil that comes. And number two, 
the evil that God sends is for a greater good. It is. It's not cliche. It truly is. He says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The serpent will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. That took place on the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus crushed the head of the serpent. Ultimate victory. But at the same time, he got bruised in his heel. And what happens when a poisonous snake bites you? You die a slow and painful death. And truly, it was the slow, painful death of the seed of the woman that brought about the ultimate victory for the human race. The judgment and the curse ultimately fell on God himself. That's the God of the Bible. Was he behind the evil? Yes. But the evil was not meant for you and I. It doesn't have to be. It was for his son who absorbs all of it on the cross and offers you forgiveness of sins, eternal life, free of sin, so that we can once again say, we can once again have fellowship with this God. And then the question of where is God gets answered with one, he, with one word in Hebrew, Emmanuel, God is here. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. But you see, this whole thing about evil was leading up to the death of God's son. And Adam realized that. And I close with this. Adam's response to all of this, he sinned. In verse 20, Adam responds by saying, Verse 20 says, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Eve hadn't given birth yet. But Adam's statement reflected that he realized he was worthy of the evil that is going to befall him. And number two, God's judgment is redemptive. He's going to do it for a greater good. The greatest pain is going to fall on him, not on Adam. And because of that, he calls the woman who has no child the mother of all living because he has faith that God will fulfill his promises. And as I close, as we look through a world full of evil, both for those of us who are here and online, we must begin by realizing that we are guilty. That we stand guilty, that we are worthy of the evil we face in the world. And number two, that God offers hope in the midst of evil. He's responsible for it. And he offers hope by sending his son, through whom evil will all be extinguished one day. It's that hope that we stand for. It's that hope that we take delight in. And that we can truly say, because God is in control of evil, how long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord? Because it's in his hands. He determines that. Jesus holds my destiny. And the same way that the Apostle Paul can say, all things work for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That same Apostle Paul will go on to be beheaded in Rome. But that same act of beheading, it's still good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You and I may not see why at this side of eternity, but one day we will see. But till then, we trust in God who sent his son, who did not spare his own son, gave him up for us all. This same God will work out all things for the good of those who love him. The question is, do we acknowledge our sinfulness before him? And do we acknowledge his free gift in the cross of Jesus Christ? Let's pray. God, we are deeply humbled at the cross. That the question of where is God is answered by the word Emmanuel, God with us. But God with us comes in the context of pain and suffering. It comes with a picture of the cross. And because of the cross, you take the ultimate pain. You take the ultimate suffering so that we realize in the midst of the suffering, you are there. Sufferings and pain does not indicate your absence. It indicates your presence. It points to our sinfulness. That we are worthy of this judgment, but it also points to your redemption. That you have absorbed all the sufferings in the cross of Jesus Christ. God, for those of us who have not yet put faith and still struggle with the pain and the suffering, we pray that you turn our eyes to the cross, to your suffering. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, thank you, Pastor Samuel. Uh, don't worry, he's not done yet. <laughs> he's going through the exam part. So I'm going to invite um, Pastor Samuel to come up on stage together with me. And uh, we're going to go through a time of uh, Q&A. Um, so, so feel free to ask all your questions, um, all your difficult, deep questions. Um, for those of you who are 
here physically, um, yeah, you can just uh, stand up and ask your question and I'll just repeat it so that those who are online can, um, can, can hear the question as well. And I think, Pastor Samuel, um, a lot of your friends are online <laughs> joining us. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, a uh, few uh, from uh, uh, Explain uh, International. So, so um, uh, if you've got any questions and you are on Zoom, you can go ahead and drop it in, in the chat and I'll pick it up um, on my phone because I'm, I'm on Zoom as well. All right, so let's just jump into uh, a whole bunch of questions here. Um, so earlier, Pastor Samuel, you talked about, um, uh, you actually sang the song, you know, God is good all the time. Yeah. Um, so how can we reconcile the fact that what many of us have been taught um, from young, God is good, you know, God is good all the time with the fact of what you've just shared today, that God is actually at fault. Um, you know, he's the one who not just... Um, allows, but he causes this uh, so-called evil or so-called so pain that we go through um, as well. So how do we reconcile the both um, right. in, in our own life, in our own situation? That, that's, that's a wonderful question. And I think that I just want to clarify something. I never said God is at fault. Um, I said God is responsible, meaning, you know, he's the one who is doing it, but he's not at fault uh, because he is good. And, and I said a common common response is that if God is good, then why are we suffering so much? And I think sometimes the answer is found in the statement, God is good. Uh, I think it was Paul Washer that once mentioned that God is good and that's a problem. The biggest problem we have is that God is good and we are not. <laughs> what happens when you have a good judge in front of a terrible criminal? It's not good for the criminal. What happens if you have a good cop in front of someone, a bad thief. <laughs> it's not good for the thief. Uh, I remember once being in, uh, I remember once, uh, you know, got invited to play and in, someone who was, uh, my friend invited me to come in. And I, I was involved in badminton and uh, she invited me to play with a friend of hers. And turns out her friend was Rexy Mainaki, former world and Olympic champion. Uh, and he was good in badminton. The guy could play. Uh, <laughs> he's, been, uh, he's won the Olympic gold. He knows how to play badminton. Um, and his goodness was not good for me because I was on the other side of the net. <laughs> it would have been good if I was on his side, um, but I was on the wrong side of the net. So him being good is not good for me. And so I think when you, the, the key to reconciling the question of God's goodness uh, and what that is to me is to realize, am I good? Uh, because if God is good, that would only be good if I'm good. But if I'm not good, God's goodness poses a big threat to my very being because he would eradicate everything else that is not good. And so when we put that there and we realize that once you understand the justice of God, you now have a framework to go beyond the justice of God and to realize his love, his redemption in the cross. It's because he is good that he makes me good. And because he makes me good, the judgment now falls on his son rather than me. I think that's the way we would reconcile that because I think so very often when we, we think of the word God is good, we, we think of it in a context of us being sinless uh, and therefore there should be no pain. But I think the apostles recognize their sinfulness and so should we. And in that sense, we can say what Paul says in Romans chapter 5 verse 3, we rejoice in suffering for suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character because our character is faulty to begin with. Thanks, thanks for that, Pastor Samuel. Yeah, I, I think it's true. Um, uh, you know, God is good not because uh, yeah, we are, we are so sinless and all that, but God is good because he reserved the punishment that was left for, for supposed to be for us, but for his son. Yeah, thank you for that uh, uh, very good idea, uh, very good thought for us um, as well. Um, we've got a question from Zoom, from Julia. So earlier you talked a little bit about Job, right? Um, and and uh, for those of us who've read the whole story, we know what Job went through. Um, and how do you how how do you explain uh, if God gives, why did God take away? Um, in especially in Job's life, you know, he he lost his family, he lost his household, you know, everything uh, that was there. He, he yeah. kind of lost even to the point of um, he himself was uh, uh, hurt physically or he went through pain, right? So how do how do you deal with that uh, to explain that? You know, if God gave, uh, but you know, but God also took away. Um, uh, that whole situation. And I think the fact is the book offers no explanation for that until the very end. And in fact, the whole point of the book is there is no explanation for that apart from recognizing that 
God is sovereign. He can do whatever he jolly well wants to do. That's the point of the book. And, you know, when you go to the end of the book, does God ever tell Job why he put Job into suffering? No. What does God do to Job? He tells Job, come, let's reason. <laughs> this is father and son like scene and he's calling him and say, come, let's reason. Let's talk about this. Were you there when you created the world? Were, were you there when I, when, I, when I set the world in the universe in place? Were you there when I drew the lines on the sand and said, thus far the oceans may come and no further? Were you there when I was laying the foundations of the earth? When the lightning goes out, do they come and report to you? Uh, when the animals and the bees cry out in the wilderness, do you hear their complaints? And Job goes, okay, 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 okay. I, I'm, I've spoken foolishly. And the point is God never answered Job's uh, he doesn't answer the why question. Why are we, what, why? Not answered. The whole point of the story is running the universe is a pretty complicated process and you don't understand it. And you would do well to trust me. And that's the point of the book of Job. And he concludes by saying, I don't understand why God gives and God takes away. But one thing I know that he is good and that I must trust him even when I don't understand what's going on. And so the book of Job concludes with God not answering the why he takes away, but casting doubts on Job's doubts that fate may arise. I'll repeat that again. The book of Job concludes with not the answer to why the suffering was there, but God casting doubts on Job's doubts in order that fate may arise. Job has his doubts, God's questioning causes him to doubt his own doubts and to realize that, yeah, there's some things that I'm not meant to understand and I can trust God with that. So I don't know why God gives and takes away. Uh, but the whole point of it is I need to trust him. And if there's any strong reason for trusting him, it's the cross of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Wow. Um, I won't repeat that because I'll probably mash it, but that's an interesting way to think about it. You know, um, God was asking or questioning Job because he wanted to, uh, uh, and it made Job doubt his doubts. Wow, tongue twister, yeah. Um, but that's an interesting concept, you know. God, God sometimes doesn't give us the answer to our why, but he asks us even deeper questions, uh, something that re will reveal um, ourselves uh, more clearly as well, right? So learning about Job, um, you know, is it, is it right to accuse God, um, in the way Job did. I mean, as you explained earlier, uh, we say something like, hey God, you know, I serve you faithfully. I serve you in church. Um, I, I'm serving in this ministry, in that ministry. Um, I read my Bible. I pray every day, you know, but why are you causing this to happen to me? You know, um, uh, and, and basically accuse God for the things that we go through, whether it's pain, whether it's suffering, um, loss of loved one, loss of job, etc. Yeah. So how do we deal? That's with a fantastic question. I think by Job's own admission, his his accusations of God were foolish. Now that's not what God is saying was right when God tells him that you know that you have not spoken rightly about me as my servant Job has. God's referring to the part that Job holds God responsible for the problems that he faced. But the accusations, however, are a whole different thing. Uh, Job, by his own admission, as I said, uh, acknowledged that his questioning was foolish. But I think there's a principle behind that that we can apply. Not to accuse God, but what do we do with our frustration? You and I have a natural response, instinctive, if you like, to respond to pain and suffering with unhappiness. Let's face it, none of us really joyfully say, I'm looking forward to suffering today. Uh, <laughs> there may be some really spiritual people out there like the Apostle Paul who can do that. I'm nowhere near there yet. Uh, but the fact is, when you face suffering, instead of accusing God behind him to take your problems away from him, why not go to God with your accusations? And I think the book of Job offers us that principle where it's about taking our frustrations to God rather than murmuring away from him. Um, because when you look through the Israelites, they didn't go to God. They murmured too, you know, but they murmured away, against from God. They never went to God. Job brings his frustration to God and God responds. Israel brings their frustrations away and murmur and God destroys them. Why the double standard? Uh, it all matters on where we go with our frustration. 
because our frustration can take us away from God or it can bring us to God. But if our frustration, the principle I think in the book of Job is to take your anger to God. And actually that's what we see in the Psalms. There are some Psalms that are pretty angry in tone, you know, and that's okay. You can take your anger and frustration to God. You know, Psalmist is saying, God dashed their head, you know, do this. He's angry. And you can do that. You can take, you and I can take our frustrations to God. But by taking our frustration to God, we are demonstrating and expressing faith. By taking our frustrations away from God, we are expressing unbelief. So I would say we can take, instead of accusing God, take that frustration to God. Tell God you're unhappy about that. That's good. It's an expression of faith because you're taking it back to God himself. And I think God rewards uh, those who come to him with that frustration. Wow, interesting. Um, I think this is one thing that uh, we all can learn, um, that actually God can take our, our, uh, our pains, our complaints. Uh, he's not a complaint center, but, but uh, you know, he can take it. You know, we he's can a good just therapist. Be, he's a good therapist. Yeah, <laughs> he listens to all of it. Uh, and then he'll ask us more questions, right? Uh, and to, to assess where we are at, right? Um, so it's, it's something interesting. Uh, sometimes we think like, I, I don't want to talk to the person straight in their face. But God is different. He can take it, right? So um, along those lines, there is a question um, here, um, uh, something practical. So uh, this person is journeying and, and he, he or she, I don't know who it is, uh, wants to advise a friend who's going through uh, job loss, financial difficulties. So how can, and can this person journey with that friend and, say, and still express that, hey, God still loves you. God, God is uh, uh, trying to be good. To, is still good to you in the process. You know what? What are some of the well, ways we can talk to our friends? Yeah, I, I would caution against just uh, giving a blanket statement about God is doing this for your good, uh, because the Scripture gives a clause to that. All things work for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And so if one is not called according to his purpose or does not love the Lord, um, telling them that God is doing it for their good can be the greatest disservice you and I ever do to them. We're not. They are actually under God's wrath, which is, goes back to my first point. God is angry at their sin. Romans 1 verse 18 says uh, that God's anger is you know, being poured out against human ungodliness and sinfulness. Uh, the righteous anger of God is there. And so we have, if the person is not a believer in Christ, the right response is to tell the believer that if you are going through pain and suffering now, you ain't seen nothing yet. Far worse suffering is coming. And your only way out of it is to recognize that you are a sinner and number two, you need a savior. And I've got the savior to offer to you. The scripture calls his name Jesus. And we've got a gospel to give to you uh, of how God can take, you know, and preach the gospel to the person about how God, you know, takes our sins for us on the cross and he pays the price for our sins and offers us eternal life to all who repent and believe in his name. So I think that I would advise against giving a blanket. God loves you. It's okay. And Ask this person if he or she has placed their faith in Christ. And if this person is committed in their faith in Christ, then uh, the next phase of that discipleship would look like, how do you express faith in God in the midst of pain and, and suffering in your life? And I would point to examples such as uh, John chapter 21, uh, where the final chapter, Jesus looks at Peter and predicts the way he's going to die. Uh, and Peter looks at John and says, what about him? <laughs> you know, you just told me how I'm going to die. Thank you very much for that. Uh, but how about, how is John going to die, by the way? I want to hopefully a little bit more gruesome than I am. And Jesus says to him, uh, what if I want him to remain until I come back? What's that got to do with you? You follow me. Now, the implication of that statement is Jesus controls how they go. And if you are Peter, think they're like, why did you do that to me? <laughs> <laughs> and so there's a re the Bible says there's a rumor saying going around that John won't die. Uh, clearly, the disciples were frustrated because, you know, like, <laughs> what's going on here? But the point is, um, at the end of the day, Jesus holds my destiny in his hand. And all things work for the good only for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And the invitation to the unbeliever is to uh, believe the gospel. And the uh, discipleship part for the believer is actually to trust in God's goodness despite the pain and suffering and being like Christ, Christ-minded in the midst of it, thinking, uh, how do I glorify God in the midst of pain and suffering? So those are the two things that I'll point out. Yeah. 
Wow. So always be Christ-minded, but if that person has yet to know Christ, um, uh, you know, actually he could be, he or she could be under God's wrath. I mean, that's something, uh, uh, it's not easy, an easy pill to swallow, but that's the truth. I mean, that's, that's the, and if the I could, it is. And if yeah. I could just add on one more thing, and I say that for believers too, if they are in sin, God will bring judgment on them. I mean, Hebrews 12 talks about how God disciplines his children. And so sometimes you go to someone that God is disciplining, he may believe her, and you're telling him, patting him on the bank, say, no, God cares for you. No, he's, he's whipping you. He's telling you to stop what you're doing. Um, and I think that, that too must be taken into account that even if one is a believer, uh, we have to be careful in saying that, is, it, is that God doing something because of their sin? Is God trying to tell them that there's something in their life that he's finding un, you know, displeasing to him? Uh, I think there's lots of things to take into account before we pat someone on the back and tell them that, hey, it's, it's going to be okay. God loves you. Okay, we've got a couple more questions. I just want to try and uh, cover as many as, as we can. Um, so there's a, a question here asking, um, uh, uh, she, he or she is saying, why does God allow evil? Uh, and well, actually you mentioned it in a very different way. You said God is responsible for, for all that. All that is uh, what we think is evil because it seems like the evil are always winning, you know, the, the people that are doing wrong, uh, they, they always put their uh, other people down, uh, they're always gossiping and backstabbing, you know, so all these things, uh, is, is God really allowing it or it, does God, um, is God responsible for all this as well, being backstabbed, being um, uh, gossiped behind your back and all that? Yeah. I, I think, yeah, that's a really good question and I think that the the starting point is very important. We start from Genesis 3, which is where we, I went to just now, which talks about God's response to the first sin. But scripture is full of passages that show that God does not merely allow sin, uh, but rather he decrees sin. For example, Isaiah 45, 7 says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Amos 3, 6 says, shall a trumpet be blown in a city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? Uh, Lamentations 3.38, out of the mouth of the Most High proceeded not evil and good. Jeremiah 32, verse 42, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, so will I bring upon them the good that I have promised them. Uh, Deuteronomy 2.30, uh, for the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate in order to deliver him into your hands as he is. Uh, as he is today, Joshua 11 was 20, for it was of the Lord to harden their hearts to meet Israel in battle in order that he might utterly destroy them, that they might receive no mercy. Uh, Judges 9.23, then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the, and the men of Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. For Samuel 16.14, now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. I've got so many passages that I could go on and on and on down to, uh, but I'll stop there and simply say that uh, when we talk about God allowing evil, uh, the scripture presents it a little bit more direct. Uh, he's, to say that he allows it is almost to imply that he can stop it. He's choosing not to stop it. Uh, but I think the scripture kind of portrays it that God, evil is an act of, until and unless we understand that evil is an act of judgment upon sinful people, humanity. Uh, we, will, we, we, we tend to think of it as someone that God merely lets it go. But it seems to be a little bit more it be active on the part of God. That it's something he's doing. It's, it's judgment, but then it's also redemptive at the end. Classic example being Joseph. Uh, his brothers sell him into slavery because of a dream that he tells them. And the dream is he will rule over them one day. Now, <laughs> that's true. The dream came from God. God gives him the dream. <laughs> the dream is used to sell him into slavery and helps him fulfill the, the dream. And now the brothers come to him later and say to him, you know, they're scared for their lives. And Joseph says to them in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. The very act of selling him into slavery was evil on the part of the brothers. But God did not merely allow it. He was the one who decreed it, who causing it to happen for good and so you know jesus looks at the evil he's going to do and he says in luke 22 22 the son of man will go not as it has been allowed but as it has been decreed uh 
when the apostles pray in Acts 4, they say, surely gathered in this holy city, Pontius Pilate and Herod to do to your holy servant, Jesus, all that your hand had predetermined. So Herod had a reason for wanting Jesus dead. He was just a lunatic. Um, uh, Pilate was just a political coward who couldn't stand up to the Jewish people. Both of them had different intentions, you see, for wanting Jesus dead. But the Bible says that God did that to do uh, what God's hand had predetermined. So it was not as if God allowed Jesus to die. Isaiah 53 tells us it pleased Yahweh to crush him. And so this is a God who is actively in judgment against evil in the world, even if it's his own son. Um, and so once we realize that, we, we kind of change the tone a little bit from saying, why does God allow evil to, we know why God has decreed evil, but why does God allow eternal life? Uh, because we deserve sin. We deserve the judgment that's to come. Uh, the most scandalous thing in all of scripture is not God permitting or God uh, decreeing evil. The most scandalous thing in scripture is God decreeing eternal life for sinners who are unworthy of it. Wow, that's definitely a, a better way to understand what we're going through right now. Uh, we need to come to a close right now. I just want to uh, circle back to basically our title, um, uh, talking about uh, COVID loss as well as the, the war, especially. I think right now it's, the focus is on Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. So um, whatever we've heard today, are you basically saying that it's not God just allowing it, but actually God has caused all these to happen um, to us? No, I think COVID. scripture says that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, scripture says in Ephesians 1.11, who works out all things according to the counsel of his will. So it's not just some things that are worked out according to the counsel of his will. All things are. Um, you, you look at Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10, declaring the ends from the beginning, things not yet done, saying my counsel will stand and I will do, I will accomplish all that I purpose. Um, so the God of scripture is not a passive God. He's a God with a plan. And that's why believers can take comfort in the statement that all things work for, good of, for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And that means, for me as a Christian, more of a practical application, when I'm suffering evil in my life, not due to sin, okay, if I, in the case of sin, now, you know, for example, let's, let's talk about David and Bathsheba. They sin. You know who actually pays the price for David's sin with Bathsheba? Who was the unborn son of David and Bathsheba? David never paid for, I mean, David's son pays the price for David's sin. David's son dies in the place of David. But you know, that's actually a foreshadow of David's other son, who is also going to come through Bathsheba, Jesus, who is going to die for his sins. And so when we, when we put that into perspective, we begin to realize uh, that what it means to say that all things work for the good of those who love him and for David, his son dying for his own sin, for his sins, was good. He, he, it's, it's an act of God judging him. It's not that God allowed it to happen. It was God was behind it, uh, but it was redemptive. It was pointing to his ultimate son, God's son, was going to die in his place. And likewise, I think the believer can look at every evil that takes place in the world and just say, take comfort in the fact in, uh, that if God is doing this, it is for my good. Uh, Let's say any evil, game, whatever it happens, you know, so if I could just put this in a slightly different way, a more provocative way. We see that God is good. You know, I, I nearly met a car accident today. It didn't happen, but just an example. Nearly met a car accident today. God is good because he prevented that from happening. No, no. God would be good even if he allowed that to happen because all things work for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You mean to say those that died in the car crash, God was not being good to them? Now, I may not realize why, just like Jesus' disciples may not know why he's dying that way. What good can come from a man who is holy like Jesus dying on the cross? It wasn't until three days later they found out. Uh, and so likewise, I may not know, Paul may not know why he's suffering. I may not know why I'm going through suffering. But through the eyes of faith, we can see that God is behind all of these things. He's not passive. He's actively behind these things. But all things are going to work for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's the blessed assurance. Amen. Indeed, that's something we should all remember. God is working together for good. Okay, sorry. Max, you got a question. Go ahead. Uh, 
allow this war to happen than in Ukraine. So as someone that is from the Ukrainian, let's say if I'm a Ukrainian, should I go ahead and protect my country and fight for it? Or should I just go, okay, come and take me, come and bomb the whole thing. It's the pre-decree by the Lord. I mean, by the Lord anyway, just sit here and wait to die. That is a really good question. And that usually is a, it is important to distinguish between God's decretive will, which is what God decrees, and God's preceptive will, his precepts. Uh, what are his precepts? And those two things may not be the same. Uh, they, may go, they may appear to con be in conflict with one another. So, for example, uh, God decrees, well, God, his precepts tell us that do not kill. But decretively, he decrees that Jesus be killed. So God can decree in his decretive will to go against his preceptive will. That's, that's all well and good. So we, we, when we come to our own lives, we must realize that there is a decretive will, and Calvin calls this uh, the secret providence of God. We, we don't know what it is until in retrospect. I only know after it's happened. Now I know, okay, it was God's will for this to happen. But and when it's happening, I don't know. Until in retrospect, I know. But we cannot conflate that with what I'm supposed to do, which is God's precepts. Now, we have duties to perform, uh, whatever they may to be in church, whether it's in the military, each of us in different realms of our life, our spheres have responsibilities, and we ought to carry those out faithful to the Lord while recognizing that behind all of these things, God's decretive will is still sovereignly reigning. And I think that's the challenging part uh, to distinguishing between these two things. So it's not fatalistic where, oh, if that's everything is decreed, uh, then why do I even bother preaching the gospel? No, my duty is to preach the gospel. My duty is to be faithful no matter what it is. That's God's precepts unto me. But decretively, I have no idea what's going on. But I'm trusting in the sovereignty of God and doing what my duties are, faithfully discharging them under him. I think such a distinction would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why would God do that to us, right? Yes. Why? I think that's that's not as simple as it may be. So, for example, uh, if you know certain things, your our knowledge determines actions. So, if there, there was certain knowledge that I had, I would not have done certain things. But turns out, not knowing it led me to do certain things, which I discovered something else, which led to a greater good. Uh, and sometimes hiding that knowledge is helpful. A good example in the scripture would be uh, the temptation of Jesus. You know. What I've, I've never fully understood until I read this commentary uh, where he was talking about the temptation of Jesus to jump down from the temple pinnacle. Now, I had always thought that Satan was trying to lure Jesus into committing suicide. Uh, <laughs> turn, well, the, one of the commentators said that, you know, the Jewish people in Malachi have been promised, Malachi 3, the Lord will return to his temple. What do you think will happen in the Jewish people 400 years after Malachi praying in a temple and suddenly you seeing Jesus of Nazareth coming down? They're going to worship him. They're not going to kill him. And that's going to thwart God's plan of wanting Jesus dead uh, for the salvation of the whole world. And so it was, it's imperative in the plan of God to hide that knowledge from them until it finds its fruition in the cross uh, and after which the gospel. And so you will find Jesus doing certain miracles and saying, don't tell them, you know, keep this. You know? so, uh, and of course, they, they don't. <laughs> That's the point. It's the fastest way to spread news. Tell people, don't say something. Uh, and yeah, but I think that that would be an example of how God's keeping information actually works out for our benefit as well. Uh, it's better that we don't know. <laughs> um, is Jesus using reverse psychology? Um, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure reverse psychology is the term, but I think that God sovereignly determines what revelation to give us and what revelation not to. And one of the greatest things that I've learned in in, in studying theology is to never express dissatisfaction at the revelation that God has given, uh, to always be satisfied with what God has revealed and to not go further or beyond uh, the scope of what God has revealed. And I think there's safety in being bound within those parameters. So I, I trust that God has disclosed to me all that I need to know. Uh, and I want to faithfully discharge my duties under him, knowing full well that he's in control of whatever happens. Uh, I think that, that's the grounds for my hope and faith at least. Yeah, sorry. Okay, we've got yeah. probably uh, probably the last question. Uh, I know we're running out of time. So for those of us who are here physically, 
we are blessed because we, we can spend some time with Pastor yes. Samuel. Um, but yeah, uh, Bill, why don't you go uh, ahead and ask All right, question. Pastor Samuel, I know that uh, many people uh, get, get hurt uh, until uh, they, they would leave the, either church or any, uh, any certain uh, Christian groups just because uh, they, they got, got hurt by the someone who is supposed to be their shepherd, brother or sister in Christ. So how can we uh, address the to toxic environment, which is obviously evil? Uh, so which toxic environment again? I didn't understand. Yeah, like uh, in scenario, uh, they, they already uh, left the church or certain okay. Christian realm just because they got hurt by the very people who are supposed to be the shepherds, right. uh, brother or sister in Christ in this case. So how do we address that? That kind of event woman. Oh yeah, that's that's a so good hit. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Uh, so I guess basically, so someone has been hurt by church, um, or by uh, by as Bill said, a shepherd, a brother, a sister in Christ. You know, um, how do how do we minister to that person? Uh, and this hurt has caused them to leave church, right? Basically, yeah. Okay. So how do you how do you um kind of speak to them again? Uh, because I don't know. I, I guess because of the hurt, they may be closed to to Christians anyway. So so yeah. How do you explain to them that uh, that hurt that they went through? Yeah. Yeah. I think I would. The way that I would do it is to reconcile. I mean, re not reconcile, but actually a point to Romans three twenty three, which says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that includes even the very people we trust to protect us. No human being is infallible. Every one of us. There's a saying, the best of men are men as best. <laughs> so at the end of the day, uh, we are all human beings. We are, able, we are, we are, we are all uh, susceptible to be deceived. And so what I would tell this person is, that is what you would expect in a fallen world. Uh, people that you trust betraying you. Uh, people that you rely on. And it's not something that the Lord himself uh, did not experience. Remember, Judas uh, betrayed him, which is actually... Very interesting because just to go off a little bit on a rabbit trail. Uh, Judah, the, you know, Judas is a Greek name for the Hebrew Judah. And so it was actually a symbol of Judah betraying the Lord. What's happening in the Old Testament. And you remember, in, I think it was it Jeremiah or Zechariah that he talks about the 30 pieces of silver, which represents Judah in the Old Testament betraying the Lord. It's the exact same thing that happens in the New Testament uh, where Judas uh, betrays the Lord Jesus as well. 30 pieces of silver again. Uh, point being, you can, if you can be a betrayed by an apostle, and I'm not talking about a false apostle, an actual, Judas was an actual apostle. You can be betrayed by an apostle himself who was personally trained by Jesus for three, three and a half years. Then you can be betrayed by anyone in the world. And so I think that that just simply points to how sinful human being is, but yet at the same time, pointing to how faithful God is, that despite the evil that takes place, we have hope and grounds for confidence in God's goodness, that despite all these things, for those who love him, even the betrayal works out for our good. Uh, I can tell that, you know, I'm, I won't get into details, but I have stories in my life where betrayals have actually been such a blessing to me that at that point of time, I'm so frustrated. Uh, Marcus knows the story. I'll spare you the details. But uh, there were people that, I mean, there was an individual that betrayed me. And, uh, and I was at that point of time so frustrated. God, why would you allow this to happen? Why would you do this to me? Uh, and And few years later, looking back today, and I'm like, thank you, God, for that, <laughs> you know, and so uh, at that point of time, I did not know what it would be, but sometimes betraying by people that you trust may not be as bad, uh, actually may be a blessing when you look at it in retrospect. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, uh, Pastor Samuel. Uh, what We've come to the end of the, the live talk for today. Uh, again, as I said, those of us who are here, please feel free to, to come and chit-chat for a while. Um, um, there's a little bit of snacks over there at the back. Uh, I'm sure Pastor Samuel would love that. And for those of us who, who are uh, on, uh, I mean, not just the snacks, but the chit-chat thing, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, with that, we want to thank him. Why don't we appreciate Pastor Samuel for his time? Yeah. All right, I just want to highlight a couple of things. Um, so, next week, 
we are at the first week already. It's going to be the 2nd of June. Um, and we are going to get uh, CH. Some of you may remember him. He spoke a little bit earlier this year. He'll be speaking at our Biz Talk next week. And he'll be, he'll be going on the, the similar topic about blockchain, uh, uh, DFI and NFTs as well. So that's an interesting topic. Do sign up. Do join us here physically. And right after that, there's going to be a, a church service. And Pastor Sam Kyung is speaking. And he is going to be back very soon. He's flying uh, back to, to Malaysia right now as we speak. Yeah, so praise God for that. And thank you all. We, we have come to the end of our talk for today. Uh, uh, do join us for those of you here for, for a time of uh, 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 mingling and, and chit-chatting. And feel free to ask more questions. I'm sure we'll all be blessed. Take care, everybody. Have a blessed week ahead. And good night. Take care. Bye.